From the vistas of the Grand Tetons, we welcome you to Lost River Legends. Our motto, Ex Tenebris, Latin for Out from the Shadows. Here we discuss Bigfoot, skinwalkers, UFOs, aliens, and other paranormal topics. We want you to join us in seeking that which is hidden and obscured from our view. We hope you enjoy the show and encourage you to reach out to us at lostriverlegends at gmail.com to share your story and leave us a message. You can also reach us at lostriverlegends.com to find access to all of our episodes, guest bios, show notes, and our blog. Prepare yourself and get settled in and comfortable as your hosts, James and Brett, enter into the realm of shadows. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Lost River Legends. My name is Brett, and I am one of the hosts of the show. We have a great show planned for you. James and I interview Preston Dennett. Preston Dennett began investigating UFOs and the paranormal in 1986 after he found out some of his family, some of his friends, and co-workers were having unexplained encounters. He's a field investigator for MUFON. He's a self-proclaimed ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and he's authored 21 books on paranormal subjects. Today we're going to be talking about one of his books. It's called UFO Healings. And in UFO Healings, he has investigated a number of cases and documented in his book people who have experienced healings as a result of contact with UFOs um, and or aliens. And so he's going to give us some great details, some great stories and accounts from his books. So we're really glad that uh, Preston could join James and I today on Lost River Legends to discuss his book in this very strange topic. And without any further delay, let's get right into the interview. Enjoy. Uh, welcome to Lost River Legends. My name is Brett. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. Uh, we have Preston Dennett with us today. And Preston, how are you doing this evening? Doing pretty good. How are you? Doing well. Um, how's that uh, weather down in California treating you? Uh, well, we've got rain for like the first time in seems like seven years, eight years. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I, I've seen some parts that have even got snow. Yeah, it's been some crazy weather. We really needed it. We've been in a heavy drought, which we're officially out of, but I'm still a little bit worried about our water situation here. Yeah, absolutely. Especially after all those fires last year, that, that was terrible. Yeah, yeah. Some came right up to, I mean, very close to where my brother lives. And uh, I know a lot of people who were affected by him. So it, very bad fires. Uh, hoping that this heavy rain will make things a little bit, you know, less fire danger. But at the same time, it's going to bring a lot of growth. And yep. Yeah, there's always the uh, we, we've had, you know, we're up here in Idaho and we've had a lot of, our snowpack is really high and we've had a lot of moisture this year. And so, you know, we feel blessed for that and we're very happy for it. But, you know, in the spring when all that runoff hits, it's, uh, you know, there's cause for concern because of the flooding that we could have, but, uh, at the same time, glad we have plenty of water. And so it's, it's something that we're happy to deal with. That's for sure. Right. Well, we, we're going to be talking to you uh, today about UFO healings. Um, can you kind of just give us a 30,000-foot a view of, of what you're doing with your work and, and, and just a summary of, of what that entails? Yeah, well, I've been researching the UFO subject for, gosh, let's see, I think it's 30 years now, 35 almost, since 1986, 88 is really when I buckled down. And uh, I've written a number of books. This latest one is called The Healing Power of UFOs, and it documents about 300 cases of people who've had a positive physiological reaction as a result of a UFO encounter. So by UFO healing, I mean you know people who are cured of a cut on their hand, perhaps, or a cold. Uh, actually, there's a long, long list of conditions. Some of these people are cured, you know, just by a beam of light coming down. Others are actually taken on board and have a really prolonged 
experience, sometimes involving operations and things like this. So UFO healings was something I never really meant to investigate, but I was talking to this lady who's having encounters, and she described this encounter she had where, well, I mean, it started out where she was diagnosed with a cyst uh, in her uh, uterus, uterine cysts, and uh, she had an experience and went back to the doctor, and they could not find the cyst. It was gone. And they're like, well, this is strange. You know, you've got fluid here in your fallopian tubes, which is only present after surgery. And she's like, well, I didn't have surgery. And, this, and then they pointed to a laser scar on her abdomen. And they said, well, we can see that you did. Here's a laser scar. Where did you get that? And she had to tell them, well, you know, I don't know. She wasn't going to tell them, you know, the truth that, that she knew what had happened, that it was ETs. Uh so she kind of just denied it. And uh, that's what got me really like interested in writing about this because I remembered there were a few other cases, a famous case involving a, a police officer in Texas who was cured of a cut on his hand, another case in France involving a man who had a, a wound on his ankle by, with an ax and also paralysis. He was cured after being struck by a beam of light, another case in Peru involving a customs official was struck by a beam of light again from this UFO and cured of nearsightedness, of all things. So, yeah, I thought this would make an interesting article, and I found a bunch of cases. So that's how it kind of all rolled out. Okay. So so these cases that you're investigating, you said that there's about 300. Are there are there any commonalities um, or, or data points that you've kind of tied into that, that stand out to you? Yeah, certainly, absolutely. I, what I did find was that this happens to all kinds of people all over the world. Cases stretch back a good hundred years, really, but don't start in earnest until the early 1950s, really. And just from that point on, there's high-quality cases pretty much each year, averaging about, about three cases a year, I would say. And... Um, I found that the healings take place in three main ways, or you know, maybe four ca categories, I guess, would be a way of putting it. Uh, there's people who are taken on board a craft and given an operation. There are people who are outside, often driving, and they're struck by a beam of light. There are people who are visited in their bedroom, and that's where the cure is affected. Uh, and this was really wild. There's about 10% of the cases uh, in which people were visited in their hospital room, you know, actually inside the hospital, uh, which surprised me at first until I really kind of looked at it objectively and realized, you know, people are visited everywhere. I've got cases of people who have been abducted out of you know, the Marriott Hotel in Woodland Hills or uh, crowded condos and just places you would never think you would see a, a gray alien. So, so that th this this really isn't restricted to any one people, any one place, um, any situation really. I mean, it, it's open up to several different uh, variables. Yeah, it's equally divided between men and women. I've got cases involving very young children, and cases involving people, you know, in their sixties and seventies, um, some quite elderly people. Most of the people who have a healing event, I had, this is definitely a pattern. Uh, I'm going to say about 50% have some UFO history, you know, in their life. They have a, a relative who's being abducted, or they're, they've experienced a number of abductions. It's in their family. So, so there, that, there could be a genealogical tie to all of this, possibly. For sure, there is. Interesting. Um, and this is something we kind of already know as researchers, that ETs do track families and it's intergenerational. But, you know, it's not always the case. Uh, it's very strange because there's a real good number of cases. You know, a third, at least, people have no prior history, certainly not that they're aware of. One lady I interviewed, uh, she actually lives in Norway and had this experience while she injured her back. She worked as a uh, graphics artist and... Uh, had injured her back so badly that it was really, you know, affecting her work. 
she, she couldn't you know, pursue her employment. And one night she wakes up and there are gray aliens around her bed. Uh, she's completely freaking her out. She is unable to really move or cry out. Uh, they did not communicate with her at all, not one word, just sort of tossed her around like a rag doll, kind of, she says, flipped her on her stomach, and were doing all this stuff to her back. And she was pretty frightened during the experience. It was very quick, and they just filed out through the wall towards this kind of glowing light outside, a weird eerie blue light. She run, jumps up as soon as she can, runs to the window to see if she she can see anything. All she sees is this really weird light, and suddenly it flashes off, and she realizes at this point that you know her back is not hurting at all. She's completely healed. Interesting. So yeah, not no one always has history, but this there is one interesting pattern I did find. Is that, you know, like, who's being healed? You know what and why? Is there any pattern? And I couldn't find one for the longest time, but finally. And I kept interviewing people, and I kept hearing the same thing. I'd ask, well, what do you do for a living? And they'd give me these answers like, well, I'm a, I'm a social worker, or I'm an you know, environmentalist. I fight for, you know, against racism, uh, this, this sort of thing, doctors, teachers, uh, inventors. There's a number of cases involving people. They seem to be doing some sort of good work for humanity. It's a loose pattern. It's not in all cases, but it turns up enough for a I certainly noticed it. Okay. So, you know, just a quick question before we we, we go any further. Uh, we, we've talked about uh, how you got involved. We've talked about some of the illnesses and conditions uh, that have uh, been healed by these uh, by these beings. Um, for for some of the skeptics out there, what 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 do you have to say about that? Because you know you're you're collecting these accounts. You're um, and so you're not one to be blamed by any of this, but you're collecting these accounts. And, and even if in the UFO community, you might see some backlash about, well, um, these things are, tra are traveling supposedly from, from, you know, thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of miles or light years away from another area, uh, just to come and do this. Um, what do you have to say about some of the skeptics that might question, um, uh, these healings that are taking place. Yeah, well, certainly I don't blame them. It's it's wild, even by you know UFO community standards, to say that ETs are healing people of you know all all of these conditions, everything minor from colds to really cancer. There's forty odd cases of cancer being cured. And what I would say is, examine the evidence. You know, don't believe me. Fine, but be open-minded enough to at least examine the evidence. And while most of these cases, I mean, they all have varying levels of credibility, you might say. Some rely solely on the person's word that this happened. But there is a good number of cases, you know, 30, 40, 50, that would certainly hold up in any court of law. And one I'll bring up is like the case of Ventura Maceres, who had an experience where he was struck by a beam of light uh, from a UFO, and uh, investigators came to investigate because he had a lot of physiological reactions, both negative and positive. Uh, he, he was apparently suffering from almost like a radiation-type illness following this event. The tops of the nearby eucalyptus trees were all burnt. A bunch of the catfish in the river died mysteriously. There was a bunch of physical evidence to support his story. But the medical evidence was particularly compelling because it was the kind of injury you really can't fake. And following this experience, he started to regrow teeth. And he was eventually you know, interviewed by about 50 different officials, government officials, law enforcement officers, private investigators, certainly UFO investigators, doctors. Uh, a lot of people investigated this case. So it's very well verified. Also, the case in Damon, Texas, involving the police officers that I mentioned early. Uh, they're driving along. They see this UFO. One of the officers, Officer Good, has his finger hanging out the, or his arm, rather, hanging out the door when this beam of light from the UFO hits them. 
you could actually feel it. He said it was kind of warm and tingly. And uh, earlier he had been bitten on his finger by his son's baby pet alligator, and it left his wound that was you know, inflamed and painful. And they raced away from the site after this you know, UFO beams them, and uh, they're pretty shook up, pull over into a diner and start talking about it. And that's when he pulled off the bandage and the cut was gone. There was no trace of it. And now we've got live interviews of these guys that are still out there uh, of them talking about this. It was well before these sort of things were being reported. And uh, one of these officers is in a high level of position, or was at the time, um, where he was supervised some 30 people. The case was investigated by a colonel from uh, the nearby Air Force Base, Ellington, I think it was, uh, who found no flaws in their story. Uh, They were interviewed many times. I mean, there's a lot of really good cases. Some of the people are being healed, are healed by their doctors themselves. And Another great case occurred here in Southern California. A lady had a tumor in her, in her breast, a cyst rather, and uh, had x-rays of it, has x-rays of it, and uh, had an experience, went to the doctor, and the x-rays show that the cyst is gone. So there are a number of cases just like that, uh, one involving Jim Schaefer in Winnipeg, Canada, who actually sent me his medical records and uh, showed me how his cyst had disappeared on, he had a cancerous growth on his neck. So yeah, there's a lot of cases out there that are excellently, you know, have excellent evidence. I think some not as good. You know, um, the, the story uh, with the, with the, with the cop, the law enforcement officer, you know, law enforcement officers, have a lot of credibility because of their job. Their job is to investigate, to fact find, to kind of get to the bottom of what happened because most of the time they're not there when a crime goes down. So that that whole uh, mode of of collecting data and being able to relay information, that's kind of their normal, that's their normal uh, way of going about things. Yeah, it's always excellent when you get someone who's got, you know, military training, perhaps. There was another police officer who was healed up in uh, England. He was healed of infertility, uh, which had been, you know, diagnosed repeatedly and could, he was not able to father children, had an experience, and his wife became pregnant. There are, you know, five or six cases involving this where people were diagnosed with infertility and later had children. So you can't, you can't fake a lot of these things. Someone was cured of diphtheria. You, uh, someone, another person cured of uh, diabetes. Another person cured of tuberculosis. And, the, and like I said, 40 cases of cancer. These, you can't fake that. Not easily, certainly. Now, when it comes to the interactions with uh, the different beings, um, you know, I... I I don't want to gloss over that part because, you know, an alien abduction or, you know, uh, seeing a UFO, those are, those are pretty life changing events. Um, are there any commonalities with the type of abductions or, um, the communication that took place or the circumstances surrounding the abductions? Yeah, I would say there's a fairly regular bell curve. There are absolutely cases with what, which I would call like contactee cases. Uh, pretty much, I'm mean, back in the 50s. There was, uh, let's see, what George Adamski, uh, Daniel Fry, Howard Menger, a bunch of these guys claiming that they were having friendly contacts with human-looking extraterrestrials. Uh, there are a number of those types of cases which do report healings. Uh, the sort of contactee movement. Well, some people think it ended in the 50s. It really didn't. It was sort of driven underground by these gray alien reports. And I was sort of expecting most of the healing cases to come from, you know, contactees. And that's not what I found. Most of the healings are actually done by grays during what you would call an involuntary abduction. Uh, What I found is that, you know, abductions, I mean, in our society, certainly it's a crime. 
you can't just go kidnapping people. Uh, so I don't see how you can get around justifying that really under any means is calling that a friendly experience, even if they do heal you. So we've got a number of cases there for people who are like, yeah, I was healed, but I just feel like they're experimenting on me. But a lot of people, a real good portion of people who've had this healing experience feel that their experience was friendly, even if they were abducted. And it's surprising because you've got a wide variety of ETs doing this. Uh, it's mostly greys. Second to that, I would say it's the human-looking ETs, Nordics, uh, praying mantis, mantids. There's a few reptilian cases in a big category of sort of a catch-all humanoids of various types. Uh, so it's pretty hard to categorize. You have some cases which are, I don't want to call them unfriendly, but the, let's say the ETs are uh, a little bit arrogant perhaps or don't display a lot of emotion or compassion for others. Absolutely, people feel it's the, they call the ETs their family, their friends, and feel it was a wonderful experience. So along those lines, um, you know, I would, I would, I don't know if there's any data or, you know, it's, it's really hard to know, but this, this seems to be a rarity and it, you know, when in the abduction phenomenon, you know, is it 3% of the abductions that there's, we're seeing positive outcomes or is it higher or is it less? What kind of, right. where does it fit? Yeah, there's been actually some really good research done on this. The first real study was uh, Thomas Bullard, who analyzed some 270 cases and found about like 5%. And that's what is reflected in most researchers, except it started to creep up after you know people started really looking into this phenomenon. Uh, Edith Fiore, I mean, I asked John or uh, Bud Hopkins about this firsthand, and he said, oh, yeah, we get cases like this, but they're very rare. And that's what David Jacobs said as well, whereas John Mack said, mm, I, you know, I've got a number of these cases. Uh, and Edith Fiore, one of the first PhDs, educated people to tackle the abduction subject, said fully half of the people she's uh, worked with have reported healing events. I don't find that true in my own files. It's probably closer to 10%, maybe a little more. But the, recently, there was a study by the Free Organization uh, with, headed by Ray Hernandez. And uh, they asked that question, you know, have you ever had a healing event? And fully 50% of the people said yes. Now, I was asked to analyze that evidence and you know, write an article in their book, a chapter in their book, about healings, along with you know, another investigator, Dr. Joe Burks. And after going through all those files, well, I think we can say that fully, you know, half is a little optimistic because a number of these people were saying that they'd had a healing event when actually they had visited, say, a, a healer on Earth who was a contactee, which to me isn't really a UFO healing in the proper sense or had undefined healings that they couldn't really point to a close association with a UFO. They just suddenly had a, you know, felt better. <laughs> uh, so when I say a UFO healing case, I mean someone who's had a direct encounter, a very close sighting, a face-to-face -face encounter with ETs, or an on-board experience. And 300 sounds like a, a lot in some ways, uh, but compared to the actual number of abductions, it's not that large. I think the actual number is probably much larger because most people don't talk about this. Uh, but it's very hard to determine how common this is, and even within you know the abduction community. I'm going to guess it's 10 to 20 percent, maybe a little more. Yeah, so it's not not to discount the fact that there are uh, negative encounters with abductions, uh, but you're you're kind of uh, for lack of a better term, scraping the cream off here and saying, "Hey, here's some good stuff that happened. Um, let's let's look at these. Let's let's examine these." And from what I understand, you're you're kind of curating these different stories and kind of uh, giving them their own space. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I could have written a book about UFO injuries probably a little more easily because there's a lot of them. Uh, but these are different, and it shows a very positive side. I think there's been a real slant towards the negative negativity when P ETs are portrayed. Certainly, greys have a not a great reputation, uh, which is really undeserved, I think. What we have is a situation where people are being abducted by ETs, and it's a traumatic experience, and they seek help. Whereas someone who has, say, a healing event it, that is not traumatic and is actually a little wild, uh, they may be reluctant to talk, not only because they don't need to, but because if they know how it's going to sound, if they say, guess what, an alien showed up and cured me of my cold. I mean, it's, why would an alien do that? Fly, where are they coming from, light years away? We're not even sure, but coming all this way to cure a person of their cold, it sounds absurd. So I think probably there's, this is why we haven't heard a lot about them. And that they've been relegated to the, you know, UFOs are fringe themselves, but UFO healings are the fringe of the fringe. You know, it's funny you bring up fringe with that. Um, it kind of makes me think, you know, are these particular ETs, are they, are they going rogue? Are they the fringe of their societies? You know, is that why, you know, it's just kind of a conjecture. Yeah, we don't know a whole lot about ET society. So it's, it's very hard to piece together exactly. You know, even if the greys are one species, we don't know. I don't think so. I think the greys are lumped together unfairly. Uh, and it's hard to say who, who, which aliens are doing what. I know there's a case from Constance Clear, an abduction researcher who's unfortunately passed away. But she interviewed this gentleman who had an experience where he was, he actually experienced two cures. One, in one he was had a mole removed, and another he had kidney stones removed. And it was uh, interesting because uh, during one of his abductions, he the ET was conversing with him. These are typical great ETs, and she w it was a female ET who was in charge of his case. And she wanted to let him know that she was the commander of the craft. And she said, which is very unusual because she's one of the highest ranking female officers uh, um, in her group. And I thought, wow, okay, so gray aliens have problems with you know, sexism, <laughs> apparently, if, if uh, she's one of the few female commanders. Which, so there was a little bit of a brief view into you know, are these guys connected to each other? Because we don't know if we're dealing with how many greys, whether they have a, what, what their federation of governments is, because we do know that they seem to be working together, some of these ET groups. Uh, but certainly greys and human-looking ETs are seen together quite a, a bit, as well as greys and mantids. And they're all, yeah, they do seem to be working together to some degree. Who's in charge and how it all comes together and, uh, well, here's another interesting case. Uh, apparently, you know, we've ha had UFOs crashing onto our planet. There's a number of UFO crashes. Roswell, certainly. Uh, the Paradise Valley in crash in Arizona, Aztec, New Mexico. There's a bunch of them. I've written several books on UFOs over various states, UFOs over California, New York, and so on. And each of them has UFO crashes. So my point is we... If we have these craft, then we have the healing technology because a very strong medical theme runs through onboard accounts. Most of the people who are taken on board are first examined. It's the single most common thing that people have, have happened to them. So if we have these craft and we have this healing technology, uh, well, there are whistleblower accounts coming out now that says exactly that, and that this technology is being used on a very limited basis to heal people. And at one point, some of the people who are handling this cover-up and dealing with the blind saucer uh, craft have, you know, are working directly with ETs. There's a number of reports where, you know, ETs and humans have sort of diplomatic meetings, I guess you would call it. And during one of these, the humans, you know, here on Earth, asked the ETs you know, about this healing that they're doing and said, why do you heal some people and not others? You know, why not everybody? 
And the two greys that they were talking to said, well, we can't answer that question because the healings that we've done, we only did on order of our superiors. So again, that shows, you know, some ranking system. Uh, I think the, their government and you know, how they decide this sort of thing is probably similar in some ways to ours in that it's a fed, federalized system, I guess. That, is that the right word? I, I, th I think so. Um, it definitely sounds like there's someone taking orders and someone giving orders um, when it comes to these. And I, I kind of wanted to back up just a little bit. We talked earlier about um, you mentioned evidence when we were talking about skeptics and, and the evidence that you suggest. Um, w we obviously have these people that are seeing UFOs, um, lights in the sky, beams of light coming down and, uh, and, and striking these individuals. Um, we have people that are being abducted and then they're scarring. Is there any correlation um, between... You know, you know, you talked about the technology that these that these creatures, these beings, are using to heal people. But um, when you shoot a beam of light at someone, yeah, uh, obviously there's technology involved. But then you have someone that's being put uh, under an operation, under a knife, and then there's there's an operation taking place. Do you see any correlation uh, between these lights being used versus an actual operation uh, aboard one of these vessels? Uh, yeah, well, what's interesting is UFOs are all about the use of light, and uh, their understanding of it is clearly far superior to ours because they send out these beams of light, which can essentially first paralyze a person. That's one, one thing they can do. They can put out a beam of light that renders objects transparent or even permeable. So basically what I'm saying is they can you know, shine a beam down on the, the side of your house and you can just walk up right through the, you know, the walls no longer there. They can levitate with these beams of light. And one thing they can do with these beams of light is cut open a person and sew that back up without a scar. Very much like we've seen on Star Trek. Um, many people have reported this. So the use of light seems to be paramount, um, even whether if it's coming out of a UFO or whether they're inside the object being operated on. Uh, most, um, I would say, like the cancer cases, are most of those are onboard experiences involving operations that are described as painful using a number of instruments. And some of these instruments are described exactly the same way. Um, people will say, oh, it's a cylinder with a sort of ball on the end. I hear that a lot. Uh, and these various instruments that are sort of handheld that send out beams of lights are very commonly described. Uh, usually these are white beams or green, uh, blue. Uh, don't get like a lot of orange or purple or certain colors for whatever reason, but that does turn up as well. So I don't know, their technology is so far advanced that people are not able, they have a real problem describing what they're looking at and start using all kinds of analogies like you know it was a cell phone with a u-shape and uh, one thing that we do hear quite a bit is when people are taken on board they are laid out on a table and they look to their right or their left or in front of them and there's a sort of a holographic display in full color full living color of their inside of their body so they can see all their organs the whole deal uh, and uh, that's very commonly described yeah, that's that's really interesting that we that these people are awake uh, to witness this and then obviously report it back if they choose to to talk about it. But there's a lot of detail, and, and with the uh, the commonality between the equipment that's being used, some of the tooling, uh, surgical surgical equipment, that's that's fascinating to me because there's obviously something there, right? Right. I mean, I've got 15 documented cases of people who are healed of back pain. And several of them describe the same exact instrument. And not only that, the several the same procedure. They're always flipped on their stomach, and this cylindrical-type instrument is pressed down on their back. They feel this pulsing of energy, and they're done. Wow. So, so yeah, some of these cases are precisely similar. There's a case from Jim Sparks, who is a fairly well-known abductee who doesn't go under hypnosis. I mean, he has, but he doesn't need to. He remembers his experiences consciously. 
he's had two healing experiences. Once he was healed of the flu, but a second, more interesting one for me was where he was taken on board and they showed him these vials of black goo, this black sort of gummy stuff, and it stunk real bad. And they said, this is our gift to you. He's like, what is this? He said, this is our gift. We pulled it out of your lungs. And he's like, oh, he was a heavy smoker at the time. So they basically cleaned out his lungs. And later, while doing the free study, there was an account from a gentleman who had the same exact experience. He was presented with these vials of this black goo. And he's like, what's this? And they said, we pulled this out of your lungs. You have to stop smoking. This is not the life we planned for you, is what they told him. Uh, a lot of cases of ETs giving medical advice. You know, that's that's fascinating. Um, and it, it makes me wonder if there's a bigger agenda at play. Um, you know, we've heard in the abduction community a lot about uh, the timelines. You know, the timelines are, are, are mixed up and they've got to get things on track. Do you think that there's any credence to that when it comes to, you know, some of these life-saving uh, procedures? Uh, well, you know, we're, we're always trying to get a handle on the ET agenda. Um, and I think these healing cases do seem to show a positive side to it. Uh, I'm not a believer that ETs are going to take over our planet at, at any time, any more than, you know, I'm a believer they're going to heal everybody because we're just not seeing that. And they've been around for a long time. What we are seeing now does seem to be historically unprecedented in terms of like the number of abductions. Historically speaking, we don't have any written accounts or really any oral traditions describing what we're seeing now in terms of these large number of abductions, our onboard experiences, and the whole idea of you know, ET visitation wasn't super popular for a long time, only until 1947 in the superwave. I do think there's they probably have a timeline or an agenda. I don't know that we've got a handle on it, but it seems like they're pushing one thing for open official contact. And I'd say that because there seems to be a slow but steady escalation of UFO activity. Uh, they show no signs of going away. Instead, it's the opposite. What started out with sort of distant sightings really sort of developed into large-scale landings all across the planet and regular waves of activity high levels of activity. And I point to things like a Gulf Breeze wave or the Hudson Valley wave or you know the Topanga Canyon wave, a Belgium wave. These regular waves occur. And that to me is sort of like a publicity campaign on their part, trying to get us used to their presence. And uh, I think as dis the disclosure movement gains steam and all these whistleblowers come out of the woodwork, which they are, uh, I think we're looking towards a real possible, you know, change in the way all of this is going down. That's it's so fascinating to to kind of s sit back and watch some of this happen, and and some of the these whistleblowers, like you said, come forward. Um, one of the co commonalities that we see in abductions are implants. Are there any cases of implants being employed, or? you know, at least knowingly being employed. Oh, yeah. That's not uncommon. And I'm going to say 25% of the people I've interviewed who have had extensive encounters have had some evidence of implants with them. And some people have uh, you know, more information, more uh, evidence, I guess, than others, certainly. One gentleman I interviewed, I wrote about him in my book, Inside UFOs. Uh, he had an implant in his sinus. The doctors, he went to the doctor. He's like, the doctors, what's this? You know, you've got this object in your sinus. It looks like a foreign body. Did you stick a pencil up your nose? What's he? And the guy's like, well, no. Another lady who did experience a healing, actually, she was healed of sort of a hypoglycemic illness. She goes to the doctor, and the doctor's like, she had been diagnosed with tuberculosis as a child and had to go, you know, for fairly regular x-rays on her lungs goes to get, you know, an x-ray as an adult. Um, she's done this many, many times. This time, there's this, gosh, this ring, this metallic ring in her lung. The, the, she's freaked out. The doctor's freaked out. He has no way to, I mean, there's just no way. It's too huge. 
this thing is, you know, fairly large. <laughs> it should not be in there. A um, number of cases like that. Just recently, uh, I was contacted by a lady from the Midwest whose son went to the dentist, and lo and behold, there's this, like, well, I want to say BB, but it's more like a, it's more like a marble, which is kind of lodged under his uh, back molar. No way it could get there. Um, I seen the x-rays. I showed them to uh, two doctors, who both diagnosed it as a foreign body. Uh, it's great evidence of an implant. I don't think implants are necessarily bad things. We really can't say for sure because we don't know. But I don't think it's like necessary for tracking or mind control or things like this because, and I say that because I've had an, at least two or three abductees experiencers tell me but the aliens told them the purpose of their implant was, well, one was told it's to measure the level of pollution in your body. Another was told it's to boost your immune system. And I think another one said it was just to monitor her health. And I've read that in a, a number of other cases as well. I've one case where a guy had his implant removed. He, uh, he actually had this boil on his face. And he was joking with his wife. He's like, gosh, what is this? Where did this come? Maybe this is an implant. Well, he was abducted that night. His encounters are fairly friendly. He's had many of them. He's learned to converse with the greys. He, had, he suddenly finds himself on board a UFO. There's the greys. He's fully conscious. And the greys are furious. They're like, what are you doing with this implant? This is the third implant that you've pulled out of your body. And he's like, well, I didn't pull it out. You know, I, didn't, I just was joking. I didn't even know it was an implant. Um, you don't have to remove it, he said. I will leave it there. And they're like, no, 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 it's too late. Now you know where it is. You're going to pull it out. We're taking it, and we're putting it in another one, and this time you'll never find it. We're putting it in a place where you'll never find it. They told him this. They conversed with him in this way. Uh, so th people, I think, have this conception, like aliens are very alien. Well, you, they're different from us, but they're more alike, certainly, than they are different. Uh, all, all the cases I have of people who've had contact with alleged ETs describe humanoids with eyes, nose, mouth, you know, arms, legs, wearing clothes, that sort of thing. So they're not like a Star Trek alien or, you, you know what I mean, with tentacles and fangs and Absolutely. so on. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. They're people just like us but different. Sure. You know, and when we talk about the implants um, – we, we, we talk about uh, Dr. Roger Lear, who's a surgeon, a ufologist, and, and his, his specialty in the, UFO, in the UFO field is particularly around implants. Um, and any of the work that he's done, has he actually, has he actually had any, um, uh, how am I supposed to say this? Has he investigated anything with these implants that he's been involved with? Uh, that have tied to your work about healings? Not directly. In fact, one of the people I interviewed who was involved in an abduction case in Coronado Island um, had her implant removed by Dr. Lear. And uh, she says that it was about a week after she had it removed, she had another experience, and they, she believes put it re-implanted her. Uh, she she did, hasn't reported any healings. I can't say that, no, there's any direct connection with his work, but his work is extraordinary. It's it's a real loss, um, you know, his death. It, it at, is. At a, at a fairly young age, because uh, these implants, I mean, some of them were actually giving off radio signals. I mean, electromagnetic signatures. What is going on there? A number of them were identical, despite being taken out of people from very widely geographic locations. Uh, a number of them were had metal that was analyzed and shown to be most similar to meteorotic iron um, and just weird things that you cannot account for. With uh, the, ab the abduction cases where they are taken on board a, a craft, um, is there any knowledge as to whether they were still uh, in Earth's atmosphere or if they were out, you know, somewhere in the far reaches of space. Absolutely. Um, I've interviewed cases, I've read a number where people you know, look out the window and they see the Earth from very far away. 
Um, I heard that a number of times. One guy interviewed a uh, Navy medic was basically invited aboard a UFO. His friend was a contactee, and he didn't believe his friend and said and dared him to introduce the aliens to him. And that, to make a long story short, resulted in an onboard experience where he was, you know, met mantis type eight ETs, very tall, 15 foot tall, he says. He's a trained observer. And, uh, yeah, he, he described exactly that. That's really interesting that uh, he got what he asked for. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't often happen, but certainly it does. <laughs> so another part of your work um, are actually what you call health upgrades. Um, instead of healings, there, there's these health, health upgrades. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, um, what I found was, I mean, there are a number of types of healings. People are directly healed of an illness that, from which they're suffering from. You know, whatever, whatever it might be, liver disease, kidney stones, eczema, um, long, long, long list of these. But then there's another type of case which I had to include because these people are being taken on board. They have an experience. Uh, they're not suffering from any you know, particular health problem, but following the experience, they find themselves physically changed. A good example is what happened to John Hunter Gray. Uh, following his experience, which was a typical abduction by Gray ETs, which he naturally recalled after about a week. Uh, he had missing time initially. He and his son were abducted together. Uh, he says following his experience, he grew two or three inches. You know, He was like a middle-aged man when this happened. His feet grew... Um, a number of sizes. His hair started growing much thicker. His he had scars which started healing. He had to his nails started growing faster. He started getting a five o'clock shadow much earlier, and it just went on and on. Cuts healed faster. He stopped getting sick of the flu or anything. And this is what I mean by health upgrades. And a number of people describe these in different ways. I've interviewed some pretty elderly people. He says. Who tell me, oh, you know, I'm 80, went to the doctor. The doctor says I have the heart of a 15-year-old. I really believe the ETs did this. So there's a sort of uh, belief among abductees in many cases where they feel that their lifespan itself has been extended. And sort of pointing towards evidence of that is one healing case, which I found really interesting, occurred in Gainesville, Florida, to Jim Law. Uh, I believe it was an attorney. or no, His name was Jim. Well, at any rate. Uh, he had a uh, hernia and had a, a long history of encounters with greys. Suddenly they showed up, and he's like, hey, if you're going to abduct me, by this time he just learned to converse with them instead of just panicking, um, why don't you heal this hernia? And they said, we know the problem that you speak of, and we will repair it. And they did. They proceeded to do just that. And he's like, wow, you know, this worked. So he's talking to them again, and they're like, he's trying to get some information. He asks, why did you, why are you contacting me? You know, wh why me? And they said, well, we are very interested in your genetics, in your ability to have a very long life, uh, which, you know, the witness found very interesting because at the time he, he had a grandfather who he was actually writing a book about um, who is 106 years old, very long life, and still kicking. So there seems to be a definite interest on the ET's part in extending human lifespan. There's a number of cases, you know, like the Jim Law case, which support that. So are are they are these are these creatures, these beings, are are they asking uh, for any anything um, back from these people? Are, are you know are they just saying, well, we'll heal you um, as long as we can take you and experiment on you. Is that, do you think there's kind of like a, like a payment, uh, for these people? So they feel comfortable, um, being abducted maybe, or, or having an encounter. Do you think that's a possibility? Um, well, so in, in some cases th that does seem to be the case. There was one lady who was healed and they told her, Oh, we did this because, uh, as a gift of your good faith in us. Another guy who was healed said, this is our gift to you for, you know, us, for, you know, you putting up with us for so many years. Uh, a, a lot of people who have, are being healed feel like 
the only reason they're being healed is because they're being used to produce hybrid babies. And uh, they're not happy about it. They'd rather these guys just go away. Um, I mean, one lady, she was healed of uh, cancer. Another lady, she was healed of gallstones. Neither of them were happy about this because these ETs did not ask them, did not tell them, and just sort of abducted them and healed them and put them back. And it left them pretty traumatized to know that at any time, these ETs could come and just do what they want. But some are, I'm like, here's a really interesting case. This lady has no prior history of ET contact, was diagnosed with renal failure, you know, could, was having some problems urinating, went to the doctor, and he's like, oh, my God, you're having total renal failure. You have to go to the emergency room right now. And she's like, okay. And instead of going to the emergency room, she drove home, called her family, called her friends, called her coworkers, her boss, and asked everyone to pray for her because she was dying. And uh, she prayed herself. That night, she was visited by a strange type of ET, not a, one I've really ever heard before, just sort of short dwarf humanoids, and uh, who rubbed her abdomen or, or where her, uh, you know, her kidneys were for a good hour or more. And she woke up that morning feeling great, went to the doctor, and he's like, what, you know, I don't believe this, what's going on? You know, I thought you were very sick. And uh, she later had a follow-up experience where the ETs came and uh, put her on a table, displayed her organs in full color, and showed her her kidneys, which were healthy, but then showed her her liver, which was, had all this dark substance in it. And they said, you know, you have to stop drinking Diet Coke. <laughs> Look what it's doing to your liver. Uh, another example of them giving medical advice. Wow, that's that's super fascinating. <laughs> you know, the opposite of a brand endorsement there. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, this is fascinating to me uh, when you when you brought up the the hybrid uh, genetic program. Uh, that's something that's highlighted in uh, David Jacobs' book, The Threat. Um, are there any cases where there are known that, that there's a baby that's been birthed, uh, that the baby's taken on board? Is there, is there something correlating there with, with a young child? Um, well, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me. Um, there are cases involving young children for sure. And I know, I know of cases who have pregnancies missing as late as up to seven months in one case. Uh, is that what you mean? Well, I mean, um, what's, I guess, what's the youngest known, uh, involvement oh. in, in these cases? Yeah. Well, honest to God, it's prenatal. <laughs> this mo a mother was pregnant and had a visitation, uh, where these ETs were sort of concerned about her baby. Or, or, you know, in utero. And the baby was born and continued to be visited by ETs throughout his life. Um, and they told him he had a hole in his heart and they were repairing it as best as they could. But at some point he would have to have surgery. And as, you know, an adult, middle-aged adult, they were still monitoring his case and said, you know what, we really think you need to have surgery now. Go to the cardiologist and uh, you need to do this. And sure enough, uh, he did have a hole in his heart, and they couldn't believe he was still alive. So that's the earliest case. There are some cases involving very young children, like four years old, a girl who had a brain tumor. ETs came and healed her, and boy, her father could not be happier with the ETs. He thanks them up and down and sideways, thanks God for the gray aliens. He says, without them, I would not be you know, kissing and hugging my most precious gift in life. So there are some very young cases. There's some cases involving very elderly people. A guy in his 70s was cured of you know, prostate problems. ETs aren't really getting anything out of that at that point. Another lady, um, this is a very early case, in 1940s, was cured of jaundice. She had ETs, this is in England, uh, a UFO hovering outside her house, ETs appear in her bedroom, cure her of jaundice, 
And she was like 67, I think. What For what reason would ETs do that? What are they getting out of it? Um, she never had a visitation after that. You know, she, as far as you know, the report says, not one before it. I didn't get to talk to her. But that's a good example of a case where they're not apparently getting anything out of it. And these occur yet of sometimes very elderly people and young. Wow. You know, I can't help but think uh, how this is altering this is altering the future. Yeah, the, it's funny. ETs kind of slide through our, our history without much notice until recently. <laughs> uh, but the evidence shows that they're pretty darn manipulative and really kind of uh, influencing society in a number of ways. Now we see it in terms of in terms of movies, uh, video games, def, uh, advertising, books. Um, ETs have saturated us. Uh, so I think that there is a level of uh, manipulation there, but right now it's still sort of this. In, it's invisible. It's it has an appearance of being li- largely, you know, hands off, laissez faire. Uh, but I think they're deeply interested in all things human, and the ET healing cases show that. Well, one last uh, question I have before we let you go. I want to know what if you're able to share with us one of your most recent. Um, investigations into that uh, or stories that came to you uh, that may not have made it into the book. Well, yeah. It's interestingly, one guy contacted me um, after you know hearing about the book and said that he had an experience where he was, I believe, cured of psoriasis. Um, as I was putting the book together, literally, you know, last chance to put anything in. I, I got another case from a gentleman, a former law enforcement officer who had survived a freak accident years ago but was left you know largely handicapped had an experience with this ufo hovering right over his house a visitation in his bedroom and uh, he was healed and that was just months ago you know like july of last year so that's a very recent case which almost didn't make it into the book but managed to squeak in just under the wire there such an such an amazing amount of information that you've curated and that you've been able to share with us today. Um, is, is there any that are your your personal favorites? Yeah, you know, he it is. I've cured people of the top ten causes of death, um, both in the United States and the world. Top, the tenth leading cause of death in the United States is suicide, <clears throat> and there are three cases where ETs have cured people of suicide at least one involves a gentleman here in california who has was suicidally depressed and actually went out into the desert and held the gun up to his head had it cocked and was ready to end his life when a gray et appeared as soon as he saw this thing looking at him he says his depression just lifted it completely voided the suicide he said and um, he had never felt suicidal since so that's that case always comes to mind because it's so unusual. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on and sharing with us uh, your book. And I'd like to give you um, an opportunity to plug your your site, um, your your books, any information that you'd like to share with our listeners. Hey, I appreciate that, and thanks for having me on the show. It's I'm really honored and delighted to talk about this subject. My website is actually my name. If you Google my name, it should take you there. The actual address address is PrestonDennett.Weebly.com. Got all my books in there, excerpts, The Healing Power of UFOs, Inside UFOs, Undersea UFO Base, Not From Here, Volumes 1 through 3 are my most current books. Well, it's been our pleasure, and we'll make sure that we have all that linked up in our show notes. So if you're curious, be sure to jump over there onto the episode show notes, and that'll give you some jumping off points as well. So awesome. Thanks so much. Hey, my pleasure. It's been a blast. And that concludes the latest episode from Lost River Legends. We can't say thanks enough for Preston Dennett for coming on the show and sitting down with both James and I. If you want to find out more information about Preston and his work, make sure to check out the show notes for links to all of his work. 
And as far as next week's episode goes, we have Miles Johnston from The Bases Project. James sits down with Miles Johnston and they discuss some incredible things. So make sure to subscribe. Make sure to hit that notification bell because you do not want to miss out on next week's episode. And lastly, if anyone out there has had any paranormal experience that they would like to share with us on Lost River Legends, make sure to email us at lostriverlegends at gmail.com. We hope everyone stays safe. We hope everyone is happy. And until next time, take care. <laughs>